Welcome everyone to Skyscraper of Wood. Timber as a game changer for the construction industry. My name is Sofia Hedström de Leo. I'm the head of sustainability and strategic communications at the Consulate General of Sweden in New York. And we're doing this webinar together with the Consulate General of Finland in New York. And we're both very excited to be part of Circular City Week. Sanna? Thank you, Sofia. Good morning, everyone here in the US and good afternoon, all of you joining us in Europe. I'm Sanna Andersson, advisor for commercial affairs at the Consulate General of Finland in New York. And we are extremely happy to host this event together with our dear neighbor, Sweden. Uh, Finland has partnered with two US states, Maine and Michigan, to promote, to promote the development of sustainable bioeconomy and clean technologies. Today, we have the pleasure to have Matthew Tonello the chair of Finland Maine Industry Working Group for Advanced Wood Construction, moderating our expert panel. Thank you all for joining us today. And without further ado, um, Matt, I'm handing the virtual microphone over to you. Thank you, Sana, and thank you, Sophia, for inviting us. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this group. We do have a group of, uh, of experts in the industry, a number from Finland and Sweden, and uh, before we start, I did want to mention to all of the uh, participants that there is a chat function that you can open up at, in your uh, in your invite, and you can uh, send in messages to all of us, and we will be taking questions uh, at the end and addressing them in the last 10 minutes of the presentation. Um, and as Sana and Sophia mentioned, I'm Matthew Tonello. I'm a project executive with Consigli Construction. Um, I'm one of the uh, the leaders in the in the in the firm uh, that is uh, leading the charge on mass timber, and I'm part of also the Finland Maine Working Group. Uh, it's a joint agreement between Finland and the state of Maine uh, to advance research and development, uh, share information, and advance uh, uh, technology to advance the the mass timber. Uh, manufacturing in the state of Maine and in the U.S. using a lot of oh. Finland's technology. Um, I would like to first give everybody a couple points that we're hoping that you you learn from today and that you glean from our uh, expert panelists. Uh, first is going to be to be able to identify and learn and understand what engineered wood is and specifically what it means when you hear the term mass timber. Uh, the second item is uh, why mass timber and the use of engineered wood uh, is going to be influencing our built environment in the U.S. Uh, starting in 2021 and, and going into the future. What kind of benefits the use of wood have for our built environment and what kind of design opportunities we've, we've seen across the world that are already uh, starting to, to take shape and uh, learn how uh, for, the, for the rest of us, the, the lay person out there is to, to learn why timber and the use of wood is actually a sustainable and environmentally preferable way to build building structures. So with that, I will uh, start with introductions and we will go around the room here and we'll start with Tanya Luthi. Hi everyone, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Tanya Luthi. I'm a structural engineer and a vice president at Intuitive in our New York office and I lead our mass timber practice. Uh, we're a consulting engineering firm. We're based in Canada, the U.S., and the U.K. Um, and in addition, in addition to my day job, which is designing buildings, I also spend a lot of time on education and advocacy for mass timber. So I'm a board member of Woodworks, which is a nonprofit here in the U.S., which promotes the use of wood in commercial and multifamily buildings. Uh, and I'm also a member of the New York City Structural Code Committee, which I'm sure we'll touch on in today's discussion. Timo, can you go next? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Teemu Halme from Antti Neuva Architects, a Helsinki-based architectural company. We are approximately 25 architects, interior architects and students. Uh, we are working on challenging projects, varying from small-scale private villas to uh, large-scale hybrid blocks and, and city planning. Myself, I'm an architect and work mainly as project manager and head designer as in uh, this recently finished Wood City Supercell Headquarters project and uh, new ongoing Sturanzo Headquarters project. Honored to be here and share our thoughts uh, on timber construction. 
Oscar, can you go next? Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Oscar Norelius. I'm an architect and a partner at White Tech Tech there. Uh, White is an interdisciplinary architecture office. Um, we have a bit, a bit over 800 employees uh, in Scandinavia and the UK. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, Anto? Hi, everyone. Anto Kauhan. I'm from Store and so Wood Products. I'm a business development manager uh, from our building solutions unit, where I focus to uh, uh, being close relationship with the customers, uh, especially investors, architects, real estate developers, or engineers who are interested to build something. And uh, my task is to influence and inspire them to use wood rather than uh, probably not that sustainable materials. So that's my role. And also acting as a project lead in our future head office here in Helsinki. Great. Urban, can you go next? Yeah. Hello there. Uh, my name is Urban Blomster. Uh, I'm also working as a business and market developer director in Södra Building Systems, uh, part of the Södra Group, uh, a forest association in, in Sweden, south of Sweden. Uh, I'm also like uh, Anto here working in early stages together with uh, architects, uh, developers and so on to uh, really understand and uh, make the right decisions in early stages. And Jessica? Yes, hi, my name is Jessica Becker and I'm project coordinator for a nonprofit in Sweden called Wood City. Um, and what the main objective uh, or the main task for Wood City Sweden is to increase uh, no knowledge and awareness uh, uh, about timber structures and wood building. Uh, mainly for climate purposes. And I'm also an architect and I've worked um, for uh, over 10 years with industrially built um, wood building systems. Great, well, thank you panelists. Um, and just so we can start with a little bit more interesting things to look at other than our faces, uh, we're going to start with Oscar presenting a uh, inspirational video showing a project that he's recently been working on. Yes, thank you. So while I start sharing the screen, this is going to be a short clip from the Sara Culture Center uh, in northern Sweden, a small city called Kolleftio. Um, you'll get a lot of info about the project, but in short, it's a 30,000 square meter development uh, culture center in a hotel. Um, is the screen shared right now? Can you see the video? Yeah, looks good. Good. This is the Sara Culture House in Kolleftio. Well, at least part of it. When it's completed in 2021, it will be 20 stories high, close to 80 meters tall, making it one of the tallest wooden buildings in the world. An architectural landmark for Kolleftio, but also for sustainable construction. In 2016, my colleague Robert Schmitz and I won the competition to design the Culture Center in Skellefteå, which is both a culture center with several theater stages, uh, two art galleries, there's the uh, city library, and then a hotel uh, and a conference center. And they can function on their own like they did before, but also start working in new ways of collaboration and using each other's spaces. Even if you go to see a play, or going to the library, or going to a conference, you'll go to the, the culture center. Combining so many cultural activities in one space is genius. Because it allows people to very easily have a cup of coffee and then, oh, let me go see this piece of art. Or, oh, is there a lunch theater performance now? It, it, it generates accessibility. I would love this to be kind of this experimental kitchen. I think in the kitchen, it's where you gather to do things. These trusses, is it just for decoration or? <laughs> no. No, they're, they're filling a function. Uh, it's, a, it's a hybrid between steel and uh, timber. Uh, and we, here we want to illustrate how the timber is good on taking pressure and uh, steel taking tension. What's unique with the Culture Center in Skellefteå is that not only the 
Slabs and uh, columns and beams are made from solid timber, but uh, even the elevator shafts. So all of the supporting elements of the structure are made from timber, and that's unique for a building of this height. All right, thank you. I think I'm going to stop it there. I cannot hear you, Matthew. Are you talking? Yeah, same here. Well, there we go. I was on mute so that I wouldn't disrupt the video. Uh, Oscar, uh, one, one piece of translation first. 30,000 square meters is uh, 320,000 square feet for us in the U.S., so that's a very large building. My question for you is, what kind of opportunities does uh, exposing wood structural systems, say columns and beams and floor slabs, uh, provide you as a designer for opportunities uh, when you're designing a building of that size? Uh, that's a very good question. I think I think it's um, one of the one of the first opportunities is of course to showcase the material um, to make sure that people understand and really feel that they're entering a timber building. Um, and this, of course, at this scale is very unique. So that's going to be a, kind of a big wow effect in this building. Um, it's also unlocking the uh, the interface between the indoor climate and the timber. Um, so that the timber can actually absorb and release humidity um, in, during the course of the day uh, to moderate the, the relative humidity indoors. And that's very important in the nor northern climate, like in Sweden, where you can have a relative humidity going from down to 6% up to 100. So it's, uh, it does have an effect on that. I think it also allows to, to reduce the building materials because you don't have to, um, uh, to add in ceilings and panelings, et cetera, to make the interiors... Uh, uh, to the level that you want. You can actually use the structure to shape the interiors. interiors. Uh, so not, not only is the structure more climate efficient, but you also have less interior finishings that you need to add on. Great, great. Well, we won't let that stand alone. Uh, let's have Timu uh, talk, show us one of his projects. Okay, in the next video, we'll see uh, uh fast uh, review of, uh, of the recently finished uh, Wood City Building headquarters for Supercell. And then last part of the video will be uh, uh, of uh, Stura and so headquarters, this on ongoing new project that we are having on our, our table. Just let me know if you see the video.
Timo, uh, when you are approached by your potential clients to ask you to design them a new building, a new headquarters, for instance, are you typically uh, having those clients ask you to design in a, spe spe a specific material or is this something that you've uh, happened upon to use wood uh, just through your choice as a designer? Yeah, we, we choose usually the latter one. So we, of course, try to propose uh, that kind of materials that we are familiar with and we really believe in. And that's the thing, for example, that has happened with, with two, two buildings here. It has all, already been uh, some sort of a starting point for, for the both projects that we, we go with food. Great, great. Well, <clears throat> let's start with uh, some of some questions that I'd like to have the panelists uh, start a discussion on. Um, the the two videos we saw were amazing uh, pieces of architecture, things that I haven't seen in the U.S. Uh, to that scale and that level of design. Um, I suspect that those are not the first wood projects that you your your firms have designed. Um, so what I'd like to do is start with Jessica and ask. What is it that you've seen in the European market, um, specifically in Sweden and Finland, that has made uh, designing in wood in this in this fashion uh, possible, and and what has caused the explosion of of wood projects in Europe? Um, well, I would say uh, number one, we have a, a, an old tradition in in wood building and timber constructions. Obviously not in this scale, but I think that that's uh, that's kind of um, uh, a basis or, or ground for for why um, why we we kind of can relate to wood as a material, a building material, uh, and especially using in in, um, in surfaces and facades. And uh, then we, at least in the Nordics, we haven't been able to build uh, higher uh, wooden structures or timber structures uh, for a very long time uh, since we had uh, a series of fires in the end of the 1800s, uh, which uh, basically um, made the government uh, ban, uh, the, uh, the, uh, ban buildings higher than two stories. And then it wasn't until um, uh, the EU, the, um, the entrance to the EU in the 90s that we were actually able to to start um, designing and building um, larger, larger wood um, timber structure buildings. And so that's kind of where we kind of um, uh, started off again, like a revival in, in wood building. And I think now uh, there are certain reasons, um, several reasons for using timber structures in larger buildings. Uh, we've done a lot of housing for the past 20, 30 years. Um, since the 90s, but we're also seeing larger structures as we saw here in the Sarah Culture House uh, and schools and, and whatnot. And I would say that it's um, mainly be because of climate reasons, because we have a new renewable resource that is uh, a local and um, that we have to use to kind of, um, to be able to change to this circular and, and bio-based economy that we're, that we're all working on to kind of, and mitigate uh, climate change. Well, that's that's great, and a great segue to a question that I've got uh, that I've seen come through in the chat and uh, related to the environment and sustainability. So, Urban, can you talk about what uh, what makes using wood sustainable? And and I have a I've long had a misconception, I guess, uh, thinking that it's bad to cut trees. Can you explain why that is not the case here? I think you have to look back some, some 100, 120 years back in history in Sweden and see how the situation was then. Because at that time we had, uh, had a big scale of deforestation for, for uh, maybe a couple hundred years. And we were very, uh, we had very much open grounds. Uh, there were cattle on the, on the forest grounds and so on and so forth. And uh, in the end of the 1890 something, we had a, uh, legislation that made it possible to, to start to reforest again. Uh, and from that time and forth, I would say we had a, a quite um, strong politic to, to really uh, build up the forest management in Sweden, uh, both in, in production, but also in, in many ways, at least the, the last 20 years in, in, 
in a holistic perspective, I would say. So, uh, and at the, at the same time, we, uh, we have invested in, in raw material, you can say, for the Swedish forest industry in many ways. Uh, so, uh, and today, at least in the southern part of Sweden, where we have our uh, mission is that we are a forest association and we have very small uh, properties in southern part of Sweden. Uh, the, I think we have the, the, the harvest area is around 2.3 hectares. It's very small areas that we, we cut, we clear cut in, uh, in the end of the, the, the period that we uh, grow the forest. So, uh, and, and, and uh, almost immediately, uh, within a year, we replant again. So we have a quite strong legislation for a long time that really look into that we we have to reforest immediately as we uh, clear cut, more or less. And if I may continue on this, uh, yeah. very valuable points from, from Urban. Um, I think the key uh, to manage forest correctly is to have certified, certified sustainably managed forest. There are certification schemes like PFC and FSC, which ensures that the forests are managed in a sustainable level so that we can guarantee the biodiversity and, and the, the uh, wellness of the forest. Uh, and as Urban said, uh, for example, in our organization, we always, cut, uh, uh, ha we always plant three new seedlings when a new tree is cut. So we keep the, the ball moving in a sense. Great, great. Um, one thing that I'd like to make a, a point of is that uh, a lot of the components that we saw in those videos are comprised of engineered wood. And engineered wood, we know, uh, is comprised of, we know, some of us know, some of us on the panel know, like our structural engineers, know that these are not made of large, uh, large trees. It, many of them are made with smaller pieces of wood that are glued and uh, finger jointed together. Um, keeping this in mind, uh, Tanya, could you maybe talk to us a little bit about um, what you see, uh, how you define mass timber in your, in your world, and why is it different from other structural systems that you use uh, to design buildings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always tell people that I think of it as a family of different products. Um, you know, a lot of people think when they hear mass timber, they might think CLT or cross laminated timber. Um, but really it's a very wide and diverse array of different products uh, which are suited for different purposes. And I, I think that's one of the things that makes it so interesting to work with as a structural material. Um, and you know, it's part of the reason when I started in my career, I, like a lot of American engineers, I didn't know anything about wood. I spent a few years living and working in Vancouver in Canada, um, which at least in North America is um, kind of a, a hotbed for, for mass timber. And um, it really kind of changed my whole perspective on how we should be designing a building. And, and I think one of the really interesting things about it is that I, you know, if you look at the context, if you look at construct, the construction industry in general in the US, you know, we're one of the worst innovators. Like if you actually look at productivity in the construction industry in the US compared to the 1960s, we're less productive than we were 50 years ago or 60 years ago in terms of output per hour worked, right? And I think one of, there's a lot of reasons for that and it's complicated, but I think one of the reasons is, you know, we're not very good at navigating this tension between, you know, there's efficiency that comes with mass production, but you can't really mass produce buildings. Like every building in some sense has to be bespoke. It has to respond to its site and its environment and its local, the local conditions and regulations. And so, you know, we're never gonna be Apple and kind of mass produce a, a million identical phones um, you know, you do see people trying to kind of do this 3D volumetric modular construction, which is kind of, I think, the closest where we can ever really come to that kind of fully prefabricated um, ideal. But what's interesting to me about mass timber is that it sort of, to me, finds this kind of sweet spot, right? It is a highly prefabricated product, um, although it's more, you know, you're not, it's, it's more of like a two-dimensional, it's almost like the flat pack, you know, sort of Ikea approach. And what that allows for is 
um, you know, much higher quality components, right? Because of the way that they're fabricated and they go together so much faster. Um, so that leads to safer construction sites. And so I just think it has a real possibility to kind of change the way um, that we actually build when we get to site. And so that's one of the things that's really interesting to me from, a, from an engineering perspective. Great. So you touched on a few things. One, one is more efficient project sites. Um, I know that uh, there's in, in one of the presentations we saw that uh, there's some modular construction going on there. So Oscar, a little off script here, uh, since, since we're following Tanya with that comment about manufacturing and how that how mass timber might allow us to look or guide the construction world a little bit more toward a manufacturing mindset. Can you talk for a second about the, anything modular that was part of your project? Uh, absolutely. I think this is one of the keys of realizing this project um, within a reasonable budget is that the, the hotel rooms are prefabricated 3D modules. Um, so the rooms are uh, pre-manufactured, um, basically fully finished um, with the bathroom, um, with the tiling, with, with everything fitted inside within a factory. Um, even the facade is mounted and all of the installations. Uh, and then they're just driven to the site on a truck. Uh, it's about 50 kilometers away from the construction site as well. So it's very close by. Um, and then they're just simply stacked on top of each other. Uh, so there's about 205 modules stacked for 13 stories. Um, and they have the, uh, the structures integrated in the modules as well. So there's no external supporting system except for the um, staircases and elevator shafts in CLT then, cross laminated timber that is stabilizing the, uh, the tower. So uh, that means that the tower has risen very, very fast. Um, it has topped out already. Uh, and the top three floors on top of the hotel rooms have been constructed as well. Um, and it's, it's completely silent. It's, it's only lifted on, uh, on site and it's dismounted and then everything is finished inside. So uh, that has been a key. And then for the culture center, it's not in 3D, but all of the components are pre-manufactured as well. Column slabs, um, and they're made to measure, like you said, Tanya, but within an industrial process. So you get all of the benefits of the rapid construction, but you can still make bespoke projects, like you said. Great. Great. Anto, I'm going to throw uh, one at you and, and ask you about Stora Enzo and how um, Stora has been contributing to the manufactured uh, building industry and, and what components uh, your firm provides and, and how you provide advantages for design teams and contractors to work with your materials. Yeah, excellent. Excellent question. Um, uh, from our point of view, um, of course, as we already know that today, uh, most of, uh, I mean, 11% of the global CO2 emissions are coming actually from construction materials. And that's primarily due to fossil-based materials that are used commonly in, in construction, such as concrete and steel. And uh, what, what we try to uh, achieve in our organization is, of course, to raise the awareness of uh, sustainable choices that you can make in a construction project. Um, we produce two types of uh, mass timber products. We produce CLT, which is cross laminated timber, and LVL, laminated veneer lumber, which are, as Oscar described, uh, very uh, pre manufactured and beast elements that can be used either in, in a modular construction as, as described by Oscar in a certain building types, like in hotel rooms or, or student accommodations or in that sort of very uh, kind of a simple, simple room, room sizes. And in other ways, uh, I would say that the use of large bespoke and precise elements that are pre-manufactured at the mill and CNC machined at the mill, which means that uh, all the window openings, doors, door openings, uh, joint details, all of that is uh, manufactured at the mill based on the 3D model that we get from the customer and from the engineers. And all of that work can be done at the mill and taking off the site activities and the load workload off the site. So that's the one of the greatest advantages of using mass timber products like CLT or LVL. Great. In a follow-up to that, um, just monitoring the chat a bit. Uh, there's a question about uh, sourcing of the timber for your panels and as it relates to uh, sustainable, sustainable forestry. Uh, what options are out there for designers and contractors and building owners alike uh, to put in a specific request for sustainable materials and where do you source your material? 
uh, we have a full chain of custody. And as said, uh, we know the um, source of our materials. We are using only certified forests. Uh, how we can guarantee that the material and the forests are actually uh, managed in a sustainable level. Um, and that's, that's the way how we control it. Great. Urban, do you have anything that you might add to sustainable forestry? Yeah, we are on, uh, on the same uh, uh, target here. We also work with uh, our association. Our members are um, uh, planning and, and uh, using the PFC and FSC certification at this stage. And we, in many ways, our owners uh, supply our own industry also. So we have a very close uh, chain of custody in that way. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, great. Um, can we talk a bit about uh, the design possibilities that Temu and, and Oscar you see in the future and uh, what kind of uh, special effects or acoustics do you can achieve using mass timber? If I start here, uh, I think uh, the learnings, for example, from the Wood City was we really can build these uh, multi-story, challenging multi-story buildings with, with wood and, and using all potential we have there, but uh, there's still a long way to go and, and sharing all the information uh, with all the participants. That's, uh, that's like the starting point for, 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 for using wood everywhere. It's, it's not just the cladding, it can be the primer exposed material for the building. And, and, and for example, for the acoustics, uh, we all know that most of the instruments, musical instruments are usually made of wood. So, so it's, it's, it's already in the, in the material. And when you use mass, mass timber, timber structures for those buildings, you, as Oscar quite nicely already explained, uh, you, you, re you really feel when you are in a boot building compared to uh, other material buildings. Yeah, and you touched upon design possibilities. I think we've, we've seen a, a learning curve uh, among uh, I mean, consultants and, uh, and producers as well these last years that has been very, very steep uh, on how to, to design larger buildings with timber. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's, it's very much mature now. We can do buildings that are at least as good as conventional structures in timber. Uh, and, and I think one, one of the things that we will see um, in the future now is, is the other industries coming along. So um, we've made it possible to make completely sustainable structures. What about the facades? What about the installations? Uh, what about the entire lifespan of the building? I think that's uh, one of the possibilities that this is un unlocking actually for us designers. Uh, you both mentioned large buildings. So, Jessica, uh, could you provide any context for the organization you represent and uh, what what you see for uh, sorry, how you influence and, and help projects, say, for instance, in uh, use in school buildings, larger structures and urban environments? Um, yeah, so uh, Wood City, Sweden uh, helps um, uh, regions and um, counties or municipalities and planning processes um, to uh, increase knowledge there so that so that um, uh, building or planning for uh, timber structures or larger wood wood buildings is possible um, since we don't have this as a um, traditionally as I said it's it's relatively new still uh, we've been building a lot of um, residential buildings, but but not quite as much uh, schools and, and other types of larger buildings. So uh, that's mainly our our job is to uh, to help uh, municipalities and and regions um, to, to understand wood building and how to plan for it to make it easier for them, basically. Great, and I think Great. I think so I think the two two examples or or three examples that we show saw saw in the videos are actually very. They are kind of a flagship project uh, representing beautiful cultural buildings and office buildings that can be built from, from mass timber products. But as Jessica mentioned, I think these educational buildings are already today the main building typology in the Nordics where mass timber is used. So a lot of new schools and uh, daycare centers are built with, with CLT and LVL already today because of the positive health and well-being effects that we, we, we know that is included in wood. So are you yeah, saying those... that schools are choosing their building types for the health purposes and 
that's one of the drivers. That's definitely one of the drivers. There are scientific research studies made where, uh, made where actually it has been seen that uh, wood, uh, is it, if it is exposed and, uh, in, in interiors, it actually improves your concentration. It lowers your stress levels, uh, your heart rates. And this way it has very much positive impacts on your health and well-being. And as we all know, we are spending nearly the whole day, uh, 90% of our days inside, indoors. And I think, therefore, it's very crucial that we consider in what sort of building we actually spend the time. And I guess that we all agree that uh, we would want to have a posit- actually a positive effect on our mood and well-being with the, with the building that we are spending the time. Timo, would you like to add to that? I think it was pretty comprehensive from 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 the healthy point of view, and and of course, uh, uh, if we got, want to go deeper and deeper with this one, I think uh, it might and and really solve bigger things. We should go for 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 this mass timber constructions that uh, uh, that really can also have the. Uh, climate change effects there that it's it's not only that kind of uh, but we, we get these healthy benefits uh, at the same time when we when we use the mass timber products for the primary structures there and we at the same time we also get these good good influences on us so why, why not so yeah Great. I often tell people Great. you know this is very unscientific but I've noticed if you're in a in a building with exposed wood structure. Just stand, stand in one spot for a little while and watch how many people will put their hand out and touch an exposed wood column or element, you know, and then do the same thing in a building that's steel or concrete and you'll, you'll notice a difference. And I think we, we've long known the benefits of green space and in, especially in cities, right, in our urban areas and how important it is to have green space. But, you know, like, like the rest of the panel has said, you spend 90% of your time inside. So why, why is it suddenly that when we talk about the environment that we have inside, we're no longer, we don't seem to be so concerned with bringing, you know, natural materials inside. So, so I've, you know, you'll never see someone hug a concrete column, I don't think. We've, uh, it, it, it comes all into a principle of biophilic design, which is actually a design uh, philosophy. Uh, or biophilia itself means that we as humans have a desire to feel uh, close to nature. So we want to be close to nature. And biophilic design actually takes this into account. And um, for example, in the projects that Demo Demo has shown earlier, like in the future head office project uh, of Stura and so, we are considering biophilia as one of the main drivers of the design. We really want to bring wood inside the building and, and show it and expose it so and create the great atmosphere inside the building. And we can even see um, uh, research being done in hospitals as an example. Uh, we're talking about biophilia uh, where you see positive effects on, on patients and recovery time, uh, which actually can decrease uh, costs then for, for, um, for healthcare. Um, so there are several studies being done about that right now. Great. So we're going to switch gears here. We're going to go from biophilia and philosophies to why is it changing and why are we talking about mass timber now? What can we do with current timber uh, construction in the codes that are allowed, uh, that allow buildings to be constructed um, and why is it changing in 2021? So um, I'll start this next session off by saying that we have, uh, as many of you on the, the panel know, and uh, all of you watching, that, that our building structures that we construct as architects and engineers and contractors have to conform to a building code. And uh, in 2021, there is uh, a new international building code, the IBC, which will be introducing uh, 17 new provisions that allow mass timber in the United States to be utilized in different types of structures than was previously allowed. Different types meaning size and height. So, Tanya, could you spend just a minute giving us the what it is last year in terms of uh, 2000, 
18 building code, I believe is the most recent IBC. And what is, what's switching gears when we get to 2021? Right. Um, it, it, is, it is quite a big change. I'll try not to get too far into the weeds, but essentially, um, you know, in, in the model code in the United States, uh, there, was, there were provisions that were called heavy timber. And these provisions were actually based on kind of historical timber construction, uh, which doesn't really, you know, kind of these turn of the century old mill buildings from the, you know, the early 19th uh, or late 19th, early 20th centuries. And we don't really build that way in timber anymore. And so the code was long due for um, a bit of a revamp in terms of the provisions for mass timber so that it could kind of reflect um, the, the products that are available and the way that we build now um, and these kinds of things. So whereas we used to be capped at six stories and 85 feet, um, which is about 26 meters, I think, if I'm doing the math right um, for, the, for the folks in Europe, um, those limits are now depending on occupancy, uh, but you can go up to 18 stories and 270 feet. So um, it's really like a huge, huge change. It's not a small, you know, it's not the sort of 10 to 20% change. It's really quite a, um, a big step change for us. Um, a lot of it based on, um, I'm sure many people know the, the Brock Commons project in uh, Vancouver, BC. They did an 18 story um, student residence. And I think this notion that we've alluded to uh, a few times already of this notion of these kind of demonstration projects of, you know, you, just, you need a couple of people at the forefront to show that this is possible. Um, and there was a lot of research that went into the, uh, you know, developing the code provisions that went into the into the new IBC, right? This, this is a slow and methodical process uh, that takes a lot of data into account, right? Which is as it should be. I mean, a lot of us are, get impatient and want the codes to change fast. Um, but you know, there's, you, you wanna make sure you're doing the right thing and, and basing your, your code on the best available data at the time. So, um, so and, then, and then you see, of course, you know, what gets a little complicated here. And one of the things that can be difficult is, although we have one model code for the, United, for the US, um, which has been the case for about 20 years now, there's still quite a patchwork of actual regulations in different states and cities. So just because there's one model code doesn't mean that that's the code everywhere. So you see on the one end of the spectrum, jurisdictions like the state of Washington, the state of Oregon, the city of Denver, which um, kind of preemptively adopted these tall, ma taller mass timber provisions from the 2021 IBC, even before the code was kind of fully complete and, and released. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have more conservative jurisdictions that are, you know, in, in New York City, the current code is still based on 2009 IBC. And we just went through, you know, we sent a code to the mayor to be voted on by the city council here, which will bring us in line with kind of 2015, 2018 IBC. So it's still going to be a few more years in New York City before we really start talking about these height limit changes. So there's quite a kind of a hodgepodge of um, of regulation. So you need to be cognizant of where your project is. And like, like I said, that notion of like every project is bespoke, not just because of its site, but because of the regulations that are in effect in that city. Great. And that's, that's a great uh, span of uh, representative codes that you just mentioned, the 2009 in New York City, which uh, we, we often think of New York City as being so progressive yet I think they're the farthest back in terms of their current building codes. And I think we're all waiting with bated breath to see uh, what they do advance forward. And I know that in the state of Maine, we're on the 2015 International Building Code. Many other states are on the 2018. And my current understanding, there's not a good database out there, but around five to six states or jurisdictions have advanced some of these tall mass timber provisions these are the 17 code changes that are going to be in the 2021 code. Five or six states have adopted or provided allowances to design teams to be able to design uh, utilizing the 2021 code. So Oregon and Washington and state of Maine, I'm happy to say, just recently uh, voted unanimously to adopt the 2021 Tallwood provisions, and they're currently in the code writing process. So. Um, Hopefully in the near future, we'll, we'll all be seeing some more expansive use of, of timber in, in our structures. Um, 
if someone from the panel who's uh, familiar with codes in the in the Europe, how does uh, were there any challenges that you saw in the industry when codes were changed in terms of getting um, manufacturers or fabricators or installers to get up to speed with what the new provisions require and um, I'm going to parlay that into a, a comment or a question for Tanya uh, about how, what do we see as challenges in the U.S. For, for adoption and getting the industry wrapped around this a little bit more tightly? Uh, see, that wasn't in the script, so nobody of, was prepared no. to answer challenges. and Maybe of everybody's course, just too young on the panel. Of course, of course. Even in the Nordics, the regulations have developed step by step. So not everything is not possible at, at, at once here. Uh, so uh, it has been a long journey to, to be able to, to create buildings like in Oslo, where you, you have an 18 uh, story uh, wooden building already in place. And in Finland, we have a 14 story residential building uh, erected and built. And uh, it has required time and effort from policymakers, regulation makers that has been made it possible. So it requires time, of course. Great. And if, if I can add to that, uh, I think it's also um, all of the legislations in the different countries in, in Europe are built in a very different way. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a slalom uh, and it's not the same kind of slalom that you do in different countries, but you always end up at the bottom, right? <laughs> um, so I think the buildings might end up looking a lot the same, but the ways to get there are quite different. Um, and uh, I think in Sweden, we have a very straightforward system, which is performance-based, where you don't actually have to go through um, codes built on previous codes, where you actually just have to show how the building performs um, structurally and in case of fire and acoustically as well. Um, so it, it doesn't really matter if you're doing a timber or a concrete building. That's not the case in most other European countries like Germany or France or the UK. Um, they're quite, uh, quite different where you actually have specific uh, ways of getting permissions for timber buildings. Yeah, with, in the States, there's a similar, right? You don't have to follow the prescriptive code provisions that you can do performance-based design and, and demonstrate. Again, you're, it's, you're trying to demonstrate that the building that you want to build is as good or better than something that would have been code compliant. And there's always that avenue. Um, I, I get the sense that it, we probably take that avenue less often um, than folks do in, in Europe. There's a little bit of a fear of, well, what if it doesn't get approved? And you know, there's extra time involved and we're all in a hurry to get this thing, you know, to, to put shovels in the ground. And so, you know, it, it, so you, you have to have the right kind of Kind of client and team that is willing to to go that way i mean i think to me that makes so much more sense rather than just kind of check box like okay um it's this much distance to the stair and you know i checked i checked all the boxes but to really think about the performance of your building um is the way we should be doing it but you know sometimes the timing doesn't really allow it so but yeah and of course understanding that if, if you go over the line with everything, that's that's very difficult. Just uh, right. un understanding the legislation and regulations, and and going over the line with just a few things, and and then proving it by calculating and 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 that kind of thing. So so it's pretty much understanding and where the limits really are and challenging those. Um, I think something that would be um, uh, worth mentioning also when we're talking about. Um, uh, rules and regulations is is uh, how Sweden has um, as of next year uh, is going to implement a new requirement for for um, building permits where um, where new buildings have to basically account for for carbon footprint uh, and this is going to be an interesting game changer because because um, timber structures are going to to um, have a completely different um, uh, possibility of, of, of taking taking lead here uh, and not not specifically saying that um, that everyone has to build timber structures but it's going to be a, 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 a general requirement basically which is also going to be a driver or a force for, for um, working on um, reducing and re reusing um, building materials too so I think this is going to be interesting to look at great Tom. 
I'm, I have to mention that we've got a, a prolific writer uh, commenting about sustainability and, and, and global warming. And, uh, and I, I wanted to just sort of go off, off script a bit here. Uh, I see a lot of comments about uh, carbon emissions and global warming. And um, rather than talking about the things that we know are somewhat politicized and somewhat left and right in, in the politics world of is there global warming and is there carbon and what does carb saving carbon mean? Um, I want everybody, I would love to have everybody just think for a moment about um, your favorite large forested area um, and, and what kind of ownership that forest is in. Um, in the U.S., we have, we have state-owned forests. In Canada, uh, the, the government owns many of the forests. Uh, in the state of Maine, most of the forested land, we have over 85% of the state of Maine is uh, forested, and it's largely privately held. Uh, that land has been privately held for many years and uh, forests have been uh, cut and then allowed to regrow. Um, we know that our paper industries around the world are retracting as much as uh, we try and pre-buy pre our toilet paper uh, in advance for future pandemics. Uh, we're not buying enough of it to keep most of the paper mills going because we're not reading the newspapers anymore. Uh, Think about what happens to that privately held land that is invested in for the purposes of returning an investment on the, for the investor who purchased the land many, many years ago, generations ago, to uh, continue to allow the trees to grow and produce something with it. Uh, without the paper industry, without, that, uh, without something replacing it, paper that is, and uh, allowing the forestry to continue, the highest and best use becomes something else. Um, I can tell you that privately held forests don't tend to stay privately held if they don't, uh, for the most part, if, unless they're producing a profit. Uh, so think about it that way. We could we can either all start buying up forests and, and putting them in uh, to uh, protection, or or we can try and find ways that we can sustainably harvest the timber. Um, move that into a way to sequester the carbon and then also keep those those large timber holders uh, in the game for us. So no one wants to see the timber, the, the large forests cut down for subdivisions and paved roadways. Uh, that was a little bit of my uh, personal opinion on that. I come from a forestry heavy state and have many, many family friends that have uh, lived and worked in the forestry industry for years and None of us want to see that happen uh, for it to go away. Um, so we're coming up on, we've got seven minutes left uh, in, in our session. I think what we're going to do is we're going to allow Sana and Sophia to maybe put together a couple of the questions that we've got and throw them into the chat so that we can address them. But uh, before we get to that, I wanted to leave it open to the, all the panelists. Um, and if anybody's got an opinion on how... Uh, European market and the Nordic countries can can help us, the U.S., uh, embark on this new world of uh, using uh, large engineered timber and, and how, how you see that cooperation can, can occur across the ocean. I Other think... than me buying Anto's <laughs> product tomorrow and putting it in my next house. I think as as all of the countries are are seeking opportunities to reduce embodied carbon from construction, so I think it's you cannot hold back the pro the progress. Uh, I think uh, the construction industry as a whole will need to change, uh, and therefore we call it as a game changer. If in in case we start to use more wood in in construction, um, so. In my opinion, um, you cannot hold the progress. The industry needs to needs to change. Yeah, right. and I, I can add also. I think we see we have seen for a long time also a substitution in the in the forest industry that we we leave old business and entering new business in forestry. So I think. Uh, some products from forest-based products will disappear and new will appear. Uh, and, and I think in many ways, we, uh, 
we also have an obligation in the forest industry to <clears throat> really seek to find out more products, more output from the products, uh, from our input of products. Uh, so that's what we're looking into, do more with every log that we put into the industry, not using so much more. So I think we can, we can do a lot there in the future time. Um, I do have one question that that um, I thought this was unfair, but Tanya should be prepared to answer this at this point. Um, it, I'm, I'm going to read it because I don't I don't think it's the fair question. So, so Tanya, when will we see a wooden skyscraper in the New York City skyline? Um, so, as you've guessed, you know I, I knew this question was coming, and I've still been dreading it all morning. Um, so. You know, I'm, I'm not one to predict the future, but I'll say a couple of things. I, I do think it will take a push from outside our industry before we see a truly tall timber building in New York City. There is a lot of inertia and resistance to the idea. Um, what I think would be the most likely push is something like what Jessica was talking about, either, um, you know, some kind of law or regulation that addresses embodied carbon. So whether that's a carbon tax or, you know, requirements to do life cycle analyses and kind of prove improvement, you know, just improve on our embodied carbon footprint or just something um, that will kind of force owners and developers to actually pay the true cost of carbon intensive materials. Um, and then you will see change in a hurry. Uh, so, so I, I think there's going to, there needs to be something that kind of goads us into it. Um, and, th and then the other thing I want to say is that, you know, I, I certainly know that tall buildings, especially in a place like New York City, which is famous for them, they really capture people's imagination. And we've talked about the importance of these high profile demonstration projects. And I do believe in that. Um, for me personally, though, if you said to me, okay, I'll give you a choice in 2025 or 2030 or, or whenever, you can have a choice between having one 50 story building out of mass timber in New York city or 50, 10 story buildings, I would probably go for the 50, 10 story buildings because to me, what's really interesting is really kind of making this kind of construction commonplace all over the city. So that's actually my wish. Um, maybe we can have both, but we'll see. Right. Well, uh, you had to, you had to mention a carbon tax. Um, we were trying to stay middle of the road here, right. but that's, that's, <laughs> but, but I want to mention that I can tell you from my own personal experience, uh, the self-imposed carbon caring people, the higher education entities, the, um, the developers who are uh, looking for more than just the single bottom line, but the triple bottom line, they're, they're the ones that are leading this world right now in terms of advancing timber construction and uh, recognizing that wood actually might pre present a, a, a better alternative from a from a from an environmental standpoint, and and whether it's self-imposed or government, we, we will see. I'm I'm sure we're going to see more of that as we go. Um, I would like to make one other mention here that in the chat, uh, Sophia and uh, Sana had put their email addresses. If you have any follow-up questions that you'd like to ask of any of the panelists, I'm sure we'd be happy to talk to you uh, afterwards. So if you can route them all to either San or, or Sophia. And I'd like to take the opportunity now to thank my friendly panelists here for a great presentation, great conversation, and um, very much appreciate your participation in this. And thank you, everyone, and hope everyone has a great rest of the week. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.